Let's talk about Cuba and why it's not working. There's not enough food, medicine, or fuel. The economy is broken. Even with a job, it's hard for most Cubans to buy the basics. And then throw in a pandemic. The people, they're tired. An unprecedented display of anger and frustration in the streets of Cuba. Miles de personas marcharon para protestar por la falta de libertades y por la paupérrima situación económica. And this, this is rare for Cuba. People daring to protest on the streets and online. Nosotros merecemos vivir, merecemos un futuro. So what's gone wrong? Why are things worse than ever? And where does the U.S. fit in? After 60 years of communism, it's hard to know just how many Cubans still support the revolutionary ideals of Fidel Castro. There are no free elections or independent polls. The state controls the media and shuts down the internet when it wants. All we know is what we're seeing and hearing. And in July, when thousands of Cubans marched in protest, they were chanting things like, and also this. The chant is from this song, released a few months ago, a song that's become the soundtrack to people's frustrations. It's a spin on Fidel Castro's famous slogan. People are tired of not only of the situation, but also tired of listening to the same things all over again. The system right now isn't working for anyone. So let's get into some of the main reasons why, starting with the absolute essential, getting enough to eat. People have to undergo uh, hour-long lines in order to get food and not even to get all the food they need. They don't grow enough food for themselves. They're an island that doesn't provide enough fish for itself. In most countries, food is supplied by a mix of public and private industries. But Cuba's communist system centralizes and controls that whole process. Farming is already tough enough. There are shortages of things like pesticides, fuel and equipment, stuff that has to be imported. And there's a drought, the worst in 100 years. Now, the government sets prices and production quotas for farmers. It collects their produce and controls distribution. But most economists agree that that kills any incentive for farmers to be more productive. And the whole system is bureaucratic and inefficient. It didn't work in the Soviet Union. It's not working in Cuba. Most Cuban uh, farmers are still dependent on the state. And that has not um, encouraged that sector from fulfilling the, the, the needs of 11 million of Cubans. What all this means is that Cuba can't feed itself. The state has to import something like 70% of food. And that just got even more expensive. In the last year, global prices jumped 40% because of the pandemic. Now, to buy food on the international market, Cuba needs foreign currency. But it doesn't have much of that. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for it. Mismanagement by the country's leaders, for sure. But also, the US embargo, which those same leaders have consistently blamed for the terrible state of the economy. Levántame el bloqueo. Levántame las 243 medidas y vamos a ver cómo tocamos. The US embargo, I think it has two effects. One is the real effect, and the other one is the way it serves the authorities as, a, as an excuse to evade their own responsibility. A full trade embargo was first imposed by President Kennedy after Fidel Castro seized power in the Cuban Revolution. This was initiated in 1962 as part of a larger effort to overthrow the Cuban government. That same embargo still exists today. It's basically a web of laws and regulations that ban U.S. companies from trading with anyone linked to the Cuban state. The sanctions also make it complicated for international companies to do business with Cuba, especially because so much global trade is done in U.S. dollars, so it has to go through banks in the U.S. Cuba still has trade worth hundreds of millions of dollars with other countries like China, Spain, and Germany. But the U.S. embargo makes it all more time-consuming and more expensive. 
And because nearly everything in Cuba is owned and controlled by the state or the military, the sanctions don't just hurt Cuba's leaders, they affect the whole economy. Under President Obama, a lot of sanctions were relaxed. He even took Cuba off the US list of state sponsors of terrorism. But his successor, President Trump, reversed that policy, put Cuba back on the terror list, and added about 200 more sanctions that target government ministries and businesses linked to the military. So far, President Biden has kept all those sanctions and even added some more against Cuban officials after the crackdown on protesters in July. What's clear is that Cuba's ability to provide for its people, which let's face it, is supposed to be the Cuban model, well, that's being squeezed like never before. And gone are Cuba's rich friends. For decades, it could count on the Soviet Union, but when it collapsed in the 1990s, so did Cuba's economy. That was Cuba's last big crisis. In the 2000s, Cuba found a new friend in Venezuela and benefited from dirt-cheap Venezuelan oil to use and resell. But oil shipments are way down because of US sanctions and the collapse of Venezuela's economy and its oil sector. And it's left Cuba struggling to keep the lights on. There's no more superpower or political ally that can boost the stability of the Cuban regime in ways that uh, happened before. Because the economy has been so bad for years, many Cubans have relied on remittances, money sent from their relatives abroad, especially those in the US. And that's an important source of dollars for the Cuban economy too. But even that tap isn't flowing like it used to. Under President Trump, companies like Western Union were banned from sending cash because they work with a bank in Cuba owned by the military. So that dried up a big source of cash. And Cubans can hardly rely on their own currency. The peso just can't buy them what they need. It got even worse when the government devalued the peso back in January as part of a major currency reform. But it created an enormous inflation. So the price of food especially went way up. It's a huge mess. And then you add a pandemic, which has cut off another economic lifeline for Cuba, tourist dollars. This year, international visitors are down by nearly 90%. Cuando desapareció el turismo por la pandemia, eh, nos quedamos con las manos cruzadas. The other devastating effect of the pandemic has been on Cuba's health system. It's often held up as an example of something Cuba's actually done quite well, at least better than some of its Latin American neighbors. But like other sectors, it's suffered from mismanagement and sanctions. And now it's being crushed by COVID-19. Hemos tenido que crear eh, capacidades de hospitalización en lugares que nunca se habían pensado. While Cuba now has a vaccine, they don't have sufficient syringes to uh, distribute the vaccine. Life has become almost intolerable. And all those pressures, well, they seem to have pushed Cubans to speak out against their government more openly than ever before. But it's all come at a cost. One organization has recorded at least 700 detentions and forced disappearances since those July 11th protests. More people in Cuba have lost their fear of being repressed and uh, going out to the streets. People are seeing that generation after generation, the time goes by and they just keep waiting. And the uh, political speech doesn't change, the solution doesn't arrive. The question is, how much longer are Cubans prepared to wait?